So I will start uh, to introduce today's event now, I think, and uh, welcome to everybody as they arrive. So it's a great pleasure to be here again this year. As many of you know, um, several years ago, I, I wanted to start the idea of getting a World Fungus Day going. And we started with having um, an international symposium. So we've done that for two years already. And uh, this is the third year now. And hopefully uh, we will build on this considerably and get something much larger going around the world in the future with the help of different mycological societies. So I'd just like to say at the moment, welcome to everybody, wherever you are in the globe, all of you um, people who are really interested in fungi and indeed also those who are only just starting to be interested in fungi. I hope that after today, you will have learned a huge amount. I'm sure I, I shall and indeed have a very day. Um, in this session, we've got four speakers who hopefully you can see lined up on your screen. We've got Sally Fryer from Australia, Bernice Bankol from Benin, Yufa Kasawa from Japan, and Ek Sangvichen from uh, Thailand. And uh, our, the idea is that we will have all four talks in close succession. And then after that, it's time to have some sort of discussion. So if you'd like to put your questions in the chat, that would be great and we'll save them up till after all speakers have, have, sp have spoken. Um, so let me introduce to you our first speaker, who, who is Sally Fryer from Australia. So um, Sally did her PhD at, at Flinders University in Adelaide, South Australia. And um, she's moved to several places and had experience in, in, in different countries and different uh, environments for fungi. Um, having worked then with um, Kevin Hyde when he was in Kong, Hong Kong um, and also in Dar es Salaam at the University of Brunei and is back in Australia where she's a senior research fellow at Flinders. Um, now, Sally is one of, I think, rather a small uh, cohort of mycologists in that she is interested in fungi, uh, aquatic fungi, that is. And of course, we all know that fungi are important in all ecosystems of our planet, in all environments. But unfortunately, those in water really are not looked at sufficiently. So that this is really a great joy to get Sally to talk here about aquatic fungi um, to enlighten all of us. So, Sally, let me hand over to you. Welcome. It's a great pleasure to have you here. OK, thank you very much, Lynn. I'm just going to share my screen. And you can see my screen now. Perfect. Great, thank you. Okay, so thanks very much, Lynn. Um, yes, I'm going to talk about aquatic fungi today. Um, and hello from Australia. Uh, so, oh, sorry. Okay, so first of all, what are aquatic fungi? Um, well, the first thing to know is fungi love water. So any mycologist will know this. Fungi absolutely lo love water. So it's really no surprise that we um, find a whole range of different species in water and there's an abundance of fungi in water. Um, they're usually different species to those that we find on land. Um, uh, sometimes you find the same species, but quite often they're a completely different community of fungi that are, that are in water. We find them all over the world, from polar regions um, all through the all through to the tropics. We find them in lakes and rivers, streams, ponds, wetlands, um, even in the open oceans, plenty in estuaries, and even in the deep sea. Um, so we just find them everywhere. Anywhere that there's water, there's fungi. Um, a really simple definition of aquatic fungi um, is that they complete all or part of their life cycle in water. And this water can be either fresh or saline, and they tend to be different fungi um, in fresh water um, and, and saline water. So obviously the, the ones that we find in fresh water, we call freshwater fungi, and the ones that we find in saline water, we call marine fungi. So how do they live? Um, so much like 
um, our land-based based fungi, we find all kinds of different ways in which fungi live in water. Um, one of the most common ways is as saprophytes. So for those who don't know, saprophytes are um, those fungi that uh, decompose dead organic matter. So for example, so say in this picture, you can see that there's a whole lot of leaves and wood in the water. So there'll be, as soon as a, a leaf or a bit of wood falls into that water, very quickly you'll have these aquatic fungi come along and um, colonize those substrates and start decomposing them straight away. And they compete really strongly for these resources that so you can have, um, you know, 10 different species, 10 different individuals, um, all inhabiting a, a single piece of wood. And so they, they, they get into that bit of wood um, really quite quickly and start decomposing it and competing quite strongly for that resource. So this is a, so saprophytes are really common because um, as you imagine, like in a photo like this, you can see there'd be a lot of um, organic material fall into the water and that all needs to be decomposed. Um, and then you have the plant pathogens or parasites. Um, so a whole lot of these plants on the riverbank here will have um, um, some parasites or pathogens in them. Um, and so these are simply fungi that can cause harm to a plant. And then you'll have, so the fish or the insects and things um, in the water, um, they will often have parasites or pathogens in them um, that are little, a little fungi that are living inside them. Um, so these are fungi that can cause harm to an animal. Um, we also have um, mycorrhizae that live on the roots of plants. Um, now for, for those who don't know, mycorrhizae are these special fungi that can live on the roots of plants and they provide, um, the fungi are really efficient at gathering um, nutrients from the soil, so nitrogen and phosphorus and things like that. And they um, uh, gather these nutrients from the soil and um, give that to the plant and the plant um, in return will give the, the fungus um, the results of photosynthesis, so give it energy. And so in this way that um, they are in a symbiosis or a mutualistic um, uh, um, interaction. Um, then there's the endophytes. So um, uh, aquatic plants have the little endophytes and these are the beneficial fungi that live in um, the leaves or stems of, of the aquatic plants. Um, and they can do things like um, they can increase, um, say, say you've got a marine um, marine plant, um, and so the the these endophytic fungi can actually increase um, this um, the plant's ability to tolerate um, salinity, or um, the endophytes can also uh, increase a plant's um, ability to fight off um, other infections. Um, and we also have in aquatic systems, these beautiful little lichens, um, which uh, obviously are a symbiosis between algae and fungi. So we have a whole range of different ways in which fungi live in water, quite similar to um, what we would have on land, but they are usually very different species to what we have on land. Now you'll have to bear with me just for a moment here. Um, so this is a really simplified um, fungal tree. Um, now there are various different versions of this at the moment. Um, and so I've just put up the most simple one just to keep it as simple as possible. Um, different um, studies have found that there are um, many more phyla of, of fungi, but um, there, there are a lot of them are contested. So for now, I'll just um, stick to a, a fairly simplified one. The, the phyla that aren't contested are, um, and are really quite stable are these down here. It's more up in this area here that you get um, so, uh, many more phyla and, and some of these contested. So this is the basic um, phylogenetic tree of the kingdom of fungi. Now, most people will be really familiar with this group down here, the Basidiomycota or Basidiomycetes. So when you're walking through a forest, you'll see the toadstools and the mushrooms and um, the bracket fungi and all of those, all of the right, nice big things that you'll see walking through a forest. Um, and there's there's um, quite a few of these. So um, moving on then to the Ascomycota, 
Um, these you may have been you may have seen before some of you may be familiar with some ascomycetes so if you're walking through a forest you might see these beautiful cup-shaped fungi um, they can get sort of to five centimeters wide um, some people may have seen them um, but then you have um, these other pear-shaped looking ascomycetes and most people wouldn't be aware of them because these are normally about 200 to 300 micrometers wide so that's about, um, yeah, about a third of a millimetre wide. So unless you're really looking for them, you won't really see them. And we get these both on land and in water. Um, and then we have the mucomycota. And again, these are really tiny little things. You may have encountered them growing um, on your strawberries and things like that. Um, and then very, very similar group, um, the zoopagomycota. Um, these, these, these two used to be um, classified um, as the zygomycetes, um, but now they are separated. Um, and then you have these amazing little organisms called the chytridiomycota or the chytrids. And these actually have these awesome little um, flagellated spores that can swim through the water. And they form these um, sporangiophores, the full of these little flagellated um, spores. And I'll talk a little bit more about them a little bit later. Um, and very similar to these are the blastocladiomycota. They also have these um, little motile spores and sporangiophores. Um, and then there's this group that use, we, the cryptomycota, we used to classify them as protists. Um, and um, when um, uh, molecular techniques came along and we could um, uh, sequence DNA, um, we found that actually these were true fungi. Um, and these are just very, very small little organisms that are usually um, parasitic in, in animals. So why did I just talk you through all of the kingdom of the fungi? Uh, because each of these groups are represented in aquatic systems. So the chytra, chyt, sorry, cryptomycota, which I was just talking about. So for example, we find um, these living as parasites in crayfish and tuna and lots of other organisms as well. Um, I know that there are some in dolphins as well. Um, the chytrids, um, we're finding that, we're finding more and more that they're actually really important in a whole lot of ecological systems, both in marine and freshwater. They, um, they attack alg algal cells. And um, we're finding that that's actually really important for um, carbon cycling in both fresh and marine system systems. So yeah, these chytrids are actually really quite important. Um, this group here, the zoopagomycota. Um, so there's some species which um, prey on um, little rotifers, so little um, invertebrates in fresh water. Um, and, and there are a whole group of um, fungi in this group that live in the guts of aquatic insects. And it's actually, we still don't really understand what they're doing there, but they're generally considered to be um, either benign or beneficial. I think, I think we're sort of leaning towards that they are beneficial. Um, and then there are the mucal mycota, and um, an example of some of these in uh, in um, aquatic systems is that they can be mycorrhizae on plant roots, um, which is really cool. Um, the basidiomycetes, which most people are probably most familiar with, um, are actually quite rare in in aquatic systems. We do find them, but they're reasonably rare. Um, what we find most commonly and what's been best studied is the ascomycetes. Um, so these are these ones, the little pear-shaped things and the little cup-shaped um, sexual reproductive structures. Um, yeah, so we find them most commonly in water. And so there's around 3,000 um, described from freshwater and around 15, 1,500 from um, marine ecosystems. And obviously there's a whole lot more out there um, whenever I'm sampling in freshwater, about half of the species that I encounter are undescribed. So how do they, they reproduce? Now I'm going to sort of focus down here um, onto the ascomycetes. Um, this is where I specialise, so that's why I'm sort of heading in that direction. And also they're the ones that um, we sort of know the most about. Um, so how do the how do the ascomycetes reproduce? So um, there's a number of different forms that they can take, but these are the two 
um, two most common or basic forms. So you've got um, these pear-shaped um, sexual structures um, that we call parathesia. And as I said before, these are tiny, tiny little things. They're about um, 100, uh, sorry, about two to 300 micrometers across. And something that's really distinctive about um, ascomycetes, in fact, it's the defining feature of an ascomycete, is that they have these um, sac-like structures inside them called um, asci, or singular is an ascus, um, and inside those are um, the ascospores. And so these are um, the results of sexual reproduction. Um, also, um, as I talked about, so um, ascomycetes can also have this cup shape um, as well. And if you take a little section of one of these, you can also see these little sac-like structures or asci, and inside those are the little ascospores. So those are the um, two main sexual um, reproductive structures of ascomycetes. Uh, okay, but they also, um, they're very clever, they can also produce um, asexual structures. Um, and I quite commonly see them um, on, on various substrates. And these can take two basic forms. There's sort of intermedia, inter intermediaries between these forms. Um, but the two basic forms are that they can form um, a coelomycete. Um, and so you can see here, these little cells are producing these little um, spores. Now the asexual structures, sorry, the asexual spores are called conidia. That's it spelled there. Um, so in a coelomycete, the conidia are formed um, inside um, a structure like this. And then we've got hyphomycetes um, in which um, the conidia are formed on things like this. It's called a conidia four, and the conidia are formed um, uh, usually at the top or along the side of a conidia four. And I'll show you some examples of those soon. So how do we study aquatic fungi? Um, well, it really depends on which group we're studying. Um, there are many, many different types of methods depending on the question that you're asking and which group that you're studying. Um, some of the common methods, um, you can culture um, spores directly from water. Um, you can culture from substrates such as wood or leaves. So if you get some wood or some leaves out of, out of the water, and sterilize the surface, then you can cut them up and put them onto agar plates, and you'll have um, the hyphae of these aquatic fungi growing out onto the agar plates. Um, a really common method for, for studying aquatic fungi, and this is what I do, is that we incubate substrates, and I'll talk more about this very soon. Um, so we, um, yeah, we're basically, we just um, collect bits of um, wood or leaves from streams or, or around mangroves or wh wherever, and we then observe their reproductive structures. Um, now, a much, a really important uh, method for studying aquatic fungi now, it's a, and it's not just an emerging field, it's, it's, um, <laughs> it's a very present field now and, and very important is um, using environmental DNA. So this is where you may get, take some um, water samples or some sediment samples or, or such like, and you use molecular techniques to find um, the DNA of um, whatever species are occurring in, in um, that water or that substrate. And um, it's, it's, um, these studies have resulted in a lot of really interesting findings. So um, we're, they're finding all sorts of things down in the deep sea, um, in marine sediments. Um, it's where a lot of the information is coming from for um, studying these cool little chytrids with the little motile spores. They are pelagic fungi, so they float around in the open ocean or in, in fresh water and um, strongly associated with phytoplankton. And as I said before, they're really important for um, carbon cycling. Um, yep, so I said that, chytrids, yep. Um, and as I said, yeah, emerging part of large scale marine ecology. So these are this sort of technique is really, really um, useful for particularly answering really big questions in ecology. Um, one, one little caveat with it is it can be a little bit confusing because um, the spores and the DNA from terrestrial species can end up in the water. So we have to be really careful about how we interpret some of the studies, um, but it's still very useful information on the whole. 
So how do I study aquatic fungi? Um, so this is a picture here of our, my recent trip up into the Flinders Ranges, um, which is in um, the arid region of South Australia. And I collected a whole lot of samples from um, that stream there. Um, so far, I've found 13 new species from that, from that collection. Um, and that's really common. I'm finding lots and lots of new species. So what I'll do is I'll um, walk along this stream and I'll pick up um, little bits of wood that are um, uh, um, submerged in the water, um, try to get bits that have lost their bark um, because that means that they've been properly colonised. If they're floating and have still got their bark on, then it means that not many fungi have colonised that bit of wood yet. Um, we want the bit of wood to be soft, but not too soft. It's, this is all the things that you learn after a while. Um, and then we put the bits of wood or leaves into um, Ziploc bags and take them back to the lab. Now, um, sometimes when we're in the field, we can, if we've got just a little hand lens or a magnifying glass, we can actually see some of these um, reproductive structures, um, but we don't normally try to look for them too much. We wait until we're back in the lab to do that. So um, incubating the samples. Um, so after we've got these Ziploc bags um, with our uh, little bits of wood in them, um, we, we bring them back and put them into um, sterile sealed containers and we add a, a layer of moist tissue paper on the bottom and um, just let them incubate at room temperature for a while. Um, usually after about two weeks, they start to pop up these little sexual or, or asexual reproductive structures. And that's really handy for us because then we can identify them. So remember what's happening here is that the hyphae are inside um, the bit of wood or the leaf and um, it's only you can only really see them, um, see what's happening when they um, pop up the little reproductive structures. Um, so I usually continue to incubate um, and examine the samples for up to about six months. Um, can just keep them at room temperature. Um, it'd be wonderful to be able to incubate them at a, a set temperature, but that's um, that's pretty big equipment and quite expensive. Um, and they do need some light, um, but not direct sunlight. Um, you need some pretty good uh, microscopes um, to be examining them. Um, so first of all, uh, I'd put a bit of wood under a dissecting microscope and sort of scan up and down the sample looking for uh, reproductive structures and any fungi that I find, um, I um, photograph and describe. And then I put a little piece of it onto a microscope slide um, with a cover slip and a drop of water and put it under a compound microscope where I'll further examine it. Um, one really important thing with these is because they are so tiny, um, I also we also have to culture them. Um, and there are various recipes that we use. We often put antibiotics in the agar, to, otherwise they'll um, get overgrown. Um, with the marine fungi, um, we use um, salts in the agar. Uh, actually, I might just... Skip, uh, I'm just realize I'm running out of time a little bit, but um, I'll, I'll just quickly say, say this. One of the reasons that um, the culturing is so important is because um, we then use um, those cultures to do PCR and DNA sequencing and this way, and, and that's really important now for being able to distinguish um, different species. So what do we find? So we get onto the pretty pictures here. Um, what do we find? Um, uh, on decaying wood and leaves, um, we mostly find these parathesial ascomycetes. So remember the little pear-shaped things? You can see some spores coming out of the top of this one. Um, we find some apothecial. So this is a little apothecial um, ascomycete. And we see find both um, coelomycetes and um, beautiful hyphomycetes like this. Um, it's actually quite tricky to identify quite a lot of the aquatic fungi. Um, the taxonomic work is kind of scattered throughout the literature. Um, there's no, like, you can't just go to a book and identify um, these aquatic fungi as you would a lot of the terrestrial species. Um, and they're very, so there's very few keys or major work. So the, the taxonomy can be challenging. And I sort of got around this by building my own database and a key that I use um, on that database. 
So um, many of the species that I find are undescribed. So um, as I said before, um, around 50% of the species that I find um, yeah, are undescribed. Um, just quickly, um, yeah, the freshwater fungi, um, there's actually a really long history of, of studying these, but it's not until fairly recently that we've really started getting into um, trying to describe a lot of them. So back in the 1880s, um, Sparrow and Hartig first um, found some aquatic hyphomycetes. Um, then in 1888, Phillips um, did a revision of Vibrissia species. So Vibrissia is um, these little apothecial things um, with lovely long spores. Um, and all the way through to um, C.T. Ingold, who was um, infamous in um, the UK for looking at um, little hyphomycetes in streams. So this is what um, some of mine look like. This is a new genus and um, species and also a new family um, in the ascomycetes. So this is typically what I'll see. So this is a bit of wood just here um, and the, the bulk of the, the sexual structure is actually underneath the wood here. Um, and this is the neck of it um, coming out here. And if I cut open that little um, bulbous part underneath, um, and then uh, all these little assai um, are inside there. And then of course the ascospores um, inside the as ascus. And this is what I showed you earlier. This is um, the phylogenetic tree that showed that this is actually a whole new family because it's um, really quite distinct from, from all, of, all of these others. Um, this is another beautiful um, freshwater fungus called Janula seychellensis. Um, this is um, the asco uh, ascoma or, um, uh, yeah, so if I cut one of those open, um, then you'll find um, the assai and the spores with these um, really nice little pads on them. You'll find that um, a lot of aquatic uh, fungi have um, little pads or appendages to allow them to attach to substrates to stop them from tumbling down, down the stream. Um, another one um, that uh, we're just describing now, um, so this is um, a little parathesium here. And, and again, if I cut that open, then this is an ascus that I find and um, an ascospore there. Um, so the, uh, I'll just show you some, an example of a hyphomycete from freshwater. This is another new one um, that we found. Um, so this is the bit of wood here, and you can see these um, canidia fours um, just poking up here. Um, and you can see that the little canidia are formed at the top here. And un under the um, compound microscope, you can see um, that this is what the canidia fours look like, and these are the canidia. I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to skip through to this one. Um, you're not supposed to have favourites, but this is definite favourites for those from um, Queensland. Hi, um, this is one of yours. Um, this was um, found up in uh, near, near Cape Tribulation. Um, this is what the Canidia falls look like, and this beautiful specimen here is is um, an amazing um, Canidia Canidium. I'll just skip through that because I'm running out of time, but um, this, this is an example of some of the earlier work on marine fungi. Um, and I just love some of these diagrams that, that they made. And um, you can see here um, a parathesium, um, an ascus, an ascospore, and again here some, some hyphomycetes. And so these are some of the marine fungi that we find. This one is really common all around the world, in particularly in mangroves. Um, so again, here you can see the little necks of the parathesia and ascus and ascospores. And then again here, an ascomycete with the big long necks and an ascus and ascospores there. Um, and this is another really common one um, throughout the world, lign lignancola lavis. Um, and this is a beautiful little um, fungus that uh, I found in the mangroves um, right near here. Um, this is a tiny, it looks like a parathesium, but it's actually an apothecium um, under a compound microscope. This is what it will look like. Um, it was a bit confusing. I kept trying to squash it and, and um, trying to look at it as if it were a parathesium, but it was actually an apothecium. 
Um, and yeah, this is what the SI looked like and the little spores. Um, so that was a pretty quick, uh, <laughs> pretty quick, pretty quick um, going through of the aquatic fungi. Um, there's a lot more information out there. Um, I've got my own website, um, the Freshwater and Marine Fungi Australia. Um, so far, I've just got um, a checklist of the freshwater and marine fungi found in Australia so far, and I update that whenever there's new fungi found. Um, but I'm hoping to build that website to put a lot more information on there. Um, there are, are two other um, really good websites, um, freshwaterfungi.org and marinefungi.org, and these are for freshwater and marine fungi from around the world. And um, that's it from me. Our next speaker is Yu Fukasawa um, from Japan. Yu is an assistant professor at the University of Tohoku. Um, and Yu actually has visited many different places um, doing research. And we were lucky enough to have him in Cardiff here a few years ago, but, but he's visited all sorts of places. And uh, now it's a great pleasure to introduce him uh, to tell us about the distribution of wood decay fungi, a topic very close to my heart. So over to you, you. Uh, thank you, Lynn, for kind introduction and giving me this opportunity again. And thank you all for coming today. My talk is about fungal decomposition of wood. So at first, forest has a huge carbon stock. Its stock is estimated to be up to 861 gigaton and accumulating 2.4 gigaton carbon annually. You may feel this is just huge and can't imagine how it is maintained. But if you know that carbon emission by decomposition is estimated to 85 gigaton per year, and carbon emission by human activities is 10 gigaton per year. You can easily understand that global carbon stock in forest is just kept dynamically by the balance between carbon assimilation by photosynthesis of trees and decomposition by microorganisms. Imagine if the global photosynthesis by trees stopped suddenly, the forest, the forest carbon stock may disappear within 10 years. You may think that such a situation is not, not a real nonsense, but similar thing can occur when forest dies in large area. This example is of pine dieback due to bug beetle in North America. Such a large forest dieback is estimated to switch forest from the sink to the, source, to the source of the carbon due to the decomposition of huge amount of dead wood generated by the event. Unfortunately, such dieback events are everywhere in the world due to increased intensity and frequency of storms, wildfires, droughts, and outbreaks of pests in recent decades. All of these events potentially create huge amounts of dead wood as shown in the previous slide. So evaluating what occurs during the decay process of dead wood after the, those dieback events is important to predict carbon dynamics and the climate change. Fungi are the main agents of wood decomposition because they can decompose lignin, lignin fraction of wood which is highly recalcitrant and protecting cellulose fraction that is utilizable by fungi as energy source. Different fungal species decompose these fractions in different ratios and the decayed woods show variety of chemical contents. Traditionally, two typical decay types are recognized, white rot and brown rot. Actually, there's another type of decay, soft rot, but let me simplify the story here. In white rot, both lignin and cellulose are decayed. However, in brown rot, lignin is not decayed and accumulates in wood. So the total amount of carbon remaining after the decomposition process might be larger in brown rot than that in white rot. Fungal community in deadwood is a primary determinant of these decay types. 
So understanding global distribution of wood decay fungi and its driving factors are important for estimating carbon sequestration under global climate change. So what is the factor structure in fungal communities in that wood? One of the primary factors is tree species of that wood. Different tree species contain different chemical contents like polyphenols, resins, and volatile terpenoids, particularly in colored hardwood. These chemicals often reduce growth of fungal colonizers and strongly affect their community structure. In particular, difference between hardwoods and conifers are critical. This figure shows the difference in fungal communities in that wood on two-dimensional space. Each symbol is representing fungal community, com fungal community composition in the dead wood samples. Similar communities are located closer, but if the two communities are completely different, they are located in distance. The horizontal axis represents host tree species, and you can see fungal communities are clearly different between hardwoods and conifers. And it is known that that sort of hardwoods are commonly dominated by white rot fungi. That root conifers are also colonized by white rot fungi, but often dominated by brown rot, brown rot fungi as well. The global distribution of trees is strongly determined by climate. Conifers are, dominate, are dominant in boreal forests, and hardwoods are dominant in temperate and to tropical forests in the Northern Hemisphere. So at the moment, wood decay in boreal forest could be dominated by brown rot process, but white rot process dominates in temperate to tropical forests. Under the global climate change, increasing, increasing temperature may induce distribution range shift of hardwood tree species to north and entirely white rot occupies the world, maybe in a very long time scale. However, in a shorter time scale, different scenario could be possible because trees have very long lifespan and individual trees cannot migrate. So they must catch up with, with climate change at the same place than hot occurs. An important thing is that climate affects wood fungal communities. This figure shows the difference in fungal communities in beech dead wood from European countries. And you can see a nice gradient from places in continental weather like Hungary to seaside weather like Belgium. And statistical analysis showed that temperature and snow cover have seen significant impacts on the communities. So macroclimate affects both tree species distribution and wood fungal communities, and we should separately evaluate the effects of climate and tree species on fungal wood decomposition by focusing on tree species, each tree species. My goal is to understand the functional distribution of wood decay fungi globally and association with forest dieback events. I think there are three approaches for this goal. The first one is my approach, field sampling of naturally fallen logs. The second one is putting many wood materials like wood blocks in many places to monitor and compare the decay process and fungal communities. A merit of this approach is that you can use unified wood materials so you can detect the, fun the effects of environmental conditions on decay process and fungal communities properly. But uh, experiments often tend to be artificial and may have misleading results due to using relatively small sized wood blocks compared to dead wood in real forests. The third approach is big data analysis because we already have some accumulation, accumulation of data of tree species distribution, fungal communities, and their decay functions worldwide. 
So some researchers are working on this approach. However, this approach is completely depending on the data stored in the database. And I think that such database is not well equipped yet. So I'm working on the first approach, field sampling and of, of naturally falling logs, uh, including assessments of wood decay type analysis and deadwood fungal communities on target tree species. So far, I did surveys on, for Japanese tree species, red pine, Georgian oak, and Honda spruce. So today I'll talk about these case studies and a bit about two ongoing studies in Europe, Europe and North America. Before going to the case studies, I'm going to show you about the method briefly. As Sari already talked about, I'm also using metabarcoding of environmental fungal DNA. That is a method to detect fungal species in wood samples by analyzing fungal DNA directly extracted from wood samples. In this process, I collected wood samples from logs in the middle decay stages to extract fungal DNA from that and using DNA, DNA sequencing data to identify their taxonomy by database. And then analyze the fungal community data with site variables such as canopy openness, vegetation and climate data like temperature and precipitation, and log variables such as diameter of the logs, coverages of bark, moss, and vegetation on the logs and soil contact of the logs. So the first case study is on Japanese red pine, which is widely distributed in Far East Asia, dominant in suburban to rural area. But a severe dieback carry started from 1970s, wiped almost all of these pine trees across Japan. So we have plenty of pine logs in forest stands, like forest parks close to our town and cities. I visited those forest parks with my axe in my hand, and thankfully I was not caught by the police and took data from 30 forest sites as across Japan. This pie graph shows the frequency of brown rot in subroutine and hardwood or pine logs. From this map, you can easily find that brown rot is dominated in the southern Japan compared to, no to the north. But you may say you may see a strange site with high percentage of brown rot in the north, northern part of Japan. I'm not sure the reason of this high percentage here, but this forest is a shrine forest, and 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 the shrine is for fox spirits. So we are joking that this fox likes brown rot. Uh, anyways. Fungal <laughs> communities in pine wood, pine deadwood, were significantly associated with climate such as temperature and precipitation. And if I use strains of brown rot, brown rot and white rot fungi isolated from pine deadwood to check their growth in different temperatures, their growth rates were not significantly different under 20 degrees Celsius, but growth rates of brown rot, brown rot fungi were significantly larger than that of white rot fungi above 25 degrees Celsius. And only brown rot fungi could grow at 40 degrees Celsius. So in the case of pine deadwood, higher temperature may promote growth of brown rot fungi and their dominance in deadwood results in dominance of brown rot, brown rot wood in the south. Next case study is for Georgia oak, which we call Konara in Japanese. This species has quite similar distribution with red pine, and they are often uh, making mixed forest. And again, unfortunately, this species is also suffered by the oak wilt disease in recent decades, like this figure. And what we did on this three species is the second approach. 
I explained previously, putting logs at several places, places and monitoring of the decomposition process and fungal community development. This experiment was just recently started, and at the moment, we have data at the time point of zero, the start of the experiment. So I'm talking about that data. The seven study sites included four sites with oak wilt and three sites without oak wilt. And interestingly, we found that fungal communities in oak stems were completely different between stems from stands with oak wilt and stand, stands without oak wilt, even though all the oak stems were taken from apparently healthy living oak trees. And also we found that species richness of brown rot fungi was negatively associated with precipitation. Precipitation and positively associated with uh, presence of oak wilt. These are the example of brown rot fungi detected from oak trees. Next case is of Japanese spruce, hondo spruce, hondo spruce. Uh, this tree is a variety of PCI azoensis, variety distri uh, widely distributed across Russia, China, and northern Japan, and is distri distributed to uh, mountain area in central Japan. And again, this species was damaged by a severe windfall due to large typhoon 60 years ago in the southernmost area. From the data at seven forest sites, what we found was frequency of brown rot wood was negatively associated with precipitation in both subwood and hardwood. And also, species richness and frequency of brown rot fungi were negatively associated with precipitation and positively associated with temperature. And the occurrence of certain species of brown rot fungi, Carousel cornea, has negative association with precipitation. And if we focus, if we focused on the southernmost sites where the spruce forest was severely damaged by the typhoon. Uh, frequency of brown rot wood clearly increased with the intensity of forest dieback in subwood and hardwood. And also, uh, frequency of brown rot fungi, such as Carousel cornea, increased with the intensity of forest dieback. Such dieback events of spruce forest are also occurring in Europe. As you can see in this photograph, where the massive dieback of spruce trees was caused by the outbreak of spruce bark beetle, Ips typographs. And the studies reported significant dominance of a brown rot fungus, Pomitopsis pinicola, in the dieback stands, which means the dominance of brown rot. But what, what about natural gradient of decay type in spruce deadwood across? Latitude. A paper from Sweden reported that the occurrence of brown rot coniophora species are positively correlated with latitude. So probably brown rot may be dominant in the north in Scandinavia, but we still do not have the decay, decay data. So I'm now doing a project on the latitudinal gradient of fungal community and the decomposition of Norway spruce logs across wider latitude, latitude range in Europe from Greece to Scandinavia. And what about North America? There is research doing the second approach, log settings across eight forest sites in the southern US. Uh, the authors uh, prepared freshly cut logs of pine, aspen, and birch of uh, these, these di diameters and put these on the forest forest floor and analyzed their decay types and fungal communities after two to six years of decay. And the results were the dominance of white rot and no clear association between brown rot and climate. 
I think a reason of this unclear relationship between brown rot and climate was that they used relatively thin logs for their experiment because many brown rot fungi prefer hardwood that is usually developed in thicker logs. So I'm now doing a project on latitudinal gradient of fungal community and decomposition of Sitka spruce logs, which has a nice distribution range along the west coast of North America. Last week, I was in Alaska for this project. To summarize, uh, in, Japanese, in Japanese red pine, brown rot occurs in warmer sites. In Georgia oak, brown rot fungi occur in the site. Uh, sites with less precipitation and with oak wilt. In the case of Hond spruce, brown rot occurs in the sites with less precipitation and after forest dieback. So climate change may increase brown rot in near future. Warm and dry climate and forest dieback are predicted to increase and grow global climate change, and that may increase brown rot and living accumulation. In general, global warming is thought to increase the composition of soil organic matter and accelerate CO2 emission. But in the case of wood decomposition, global warming may increase brown rot and thus may reduce CO2 emission in some, per in some percentage. I think. However, so far, my data came from Japan only. We are now doing two big projects in Europe and North America, but we still have large unexplored area for decay type and fungal community surveys in Eurasia, tropics, and southern hemisphere. So I would like to visit this forest in future. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, you. And perhaps you could stop sharing your screen now. It's yes. wonderful to hear um, how your work is progressing on, on a global scale and very, very appropriate for our celebration of, of a world day of, of fungi. So let me now introduce our next speaker of the day. Um, so we're, we're moving slightly westward um, to Thailand, the land of smiles. And it, it's a great pleasure now to introduce to you Ek Sangvichian. Um, Ek was an undergraduate at the Chulalongkorn University in Bangkok. And then he moved to the UK to do his PhD at Liverpool John Moores University with, with Tony Wally. And uh, of course, he now is a, a lecturer um, in in Bangkok at the Ram Kang Hang University. And um, Ek is a, a lichenologist in particular. So he spent the last 20 years working on lichenology. I should also say that he received in 2009 the Benefactors Award from the British Mycological Society. Often people talk about fungi and lichens, which is a really very silly thing to say because of course lichens are fungi. Um, but often they are kept separate. We thought it was very important that today we included lichens in our programme. Um, so let me hand over to Ek, who will tell us about lichens in Thailand. Thank you, Ek. Would you like to share your screen now? Yes, I'm um, half mycologist and half lichenologist, but mostly of my work concerned with the fungal partner, the my the mycology more than the 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 algal partner. So uh, my talk today uh, will be two parts. One will start with the field work to let the audience know about the diversity of uh, lichenized fungi and uh, about the Southeast Asia, the uh, uh, especially in Thailand for the lichen study and also the tropical forest. And the latter one will be the laboratory work for culturing the lichen forming fungi, uh, the lichen herbarium and uh, uh, another work in the 
our research unit. So uh, most of the fungal diversity study in the past is uh, mainly by the, the big area or the big country. Thailand is not a big country, but uh, we have the problem with the industrialized to uh, destroy the forest in the past a lot. And uh, uh, industrialized uh, with the pollution to the uh, nature. This is uh, the main problem for the uh, developing country. So this we care a lot that uh, we can lose the uh, diversity of the life in uh, our country. Like can study in Thailand is not, uh, it's just only past, uh, start about one, 100 years ago. It was done by the Danish expedition to the Ko Chang in the Gulf of Thailand area. So he collect about 95 uh, species belong to 29 genera. This is uh, about 100 years ago. And then this team also collect the sample from the north of Thailand. So this uh, specimen now belong to the museum in Finland and in Copenhagen. The next uh, survey was done uh, in the island of uh, Gulf of Thailand too. And 1960, uh, Sato from Japan collect the sample from Doi Intenon. This is a, uh, <clears throat> this uh, sample also uh, kept in uh, Japan. And after that is a period that uh, when Pat Bruce and Bikanya and my colleague, uh, Dr. Kansi Bun uh, study about the ecology of lichens after fire in the northern of Thailand. That's uh, those, uh, most of this work done before I start my research. So in 1995, uh, Queen Silicate Garden uh, was established and they have a fund for the scientists to explore uh, lichen in the garden area. This is uh, the first start for lichen work from uh, our group. And next is a uh, grant from BRT or Biodiversity Research Program Thailand for study at the area between north and northeast of Thailand at the Putin Sonsai. Uh, National Park. And next is a workshop uh, arranged by Patrick McCarthy, uh, Pat Woosley, and Brian Coppins to set the first workshop for lichen in the tropics. In 1998, we got the first phase for research fund. This is a first step that we can uh, generate the research work for lichen study in, in Thailand. And the uh, year 2000, we got uh, some specimen donated by Professor Randell, which I will show you later. This is the first step that we can have the uh, specimen and database and uh, literature to study uh, about the lichen. And one uh, interesting point is uh, in 2012 that we organized the IAL or International Association for Lichenology is the first time that uh, outside Europe. So 
that time we are exciting because uh, it's a big flooding in the country and the water came near to the hotel. But the meeting passed very well. And after that, we joined to the IMC 10 uh, for the International Mycological Congress. So when uh, talking about the lichen in, in Thailand, in the past, we, we knew a few. What is a lichen? So in the uh, textbook, it just only show the morphology of the lichen, like the clusters, folios, and fruticos. So most of the students or the staff just know only that. But when we start to work, we learn more and we ask for the local network in Thailand, uh, some from universities like in the north, from Chiang Mai University, Sri Lankan in the Bangkok, Kaisat also in Bangkok. And <clears throat> with uh, other uh, government uh, office, like the Royal Forest Department and the uh, Plant Conservation Project under Princess Twin Pond, uh, parentage to do the research. Also with the Royal Thai Navy that they have the small island in the Navy base at the Sumer San, which is a place we can uh, study the coastal lichen. And for the Asian uh, country, we also have the cooperate between Thailand and Philippines, Malaysia, Vietnam, and Indonesia. Unfortunately, the some country that uh, did not have a uh, lichenologist like to join us, but we are happy to help and we can learn more together for the lichen in the tropics. And for the continent and international <laughs> collaboration between uh, our team uh, with like the uh, Chinese Academy of uh, CS in China, uh, Akita University in Japan, India, uh, Europe, and uh, America. <laughs> this is a uh, good cooperation that uh, we can learn together for uh, the tropical lichens. Why we study lichen, uh, tropical lichens? <clears throat> if you look at the forest in the tropics, it's uh, various type of the forest and Lichen diversity in the forest, there are different uh, among this uh, type of the forest. Uh, for example, of the forest in the tropicals is like the tropical rainforest, lower mountain rainforest, diatypical carp forest, uh, dry evergreen forest, and secondary forest. So lichen communities are different among these forests. This is an example of the lichens uh, among these forests. For example, for the uh, dry evergreen forest, the, the canopy level, you can find the uh, Pamotima tinctorum, uh, Lyricina berbotics, Hematoma, and some other else. But at the low level of the dry evergreen forest, there are some other groups like the cyanolichen, uh, Cococapia, Leptogium, and Xenogonium is an example of the cyanolichens. We also have the uh, some small piece of lichens uh, on the uh, tree there, like the Ocelolalia, and some from the 
graphidaceae group like the Ophergapha and and Antatotisium. And at the lower mountain forest, especially in the north of Thailand, we can find uh, some maybe uh, look like the, from the temperate, like the Cladonia and the Usnia group. But this is not much, it's uh, only at the high elevation of the area. So in the middle of the country is a diptrocarp forest. You can find a lot of the castos lichen. Uh, number C, Laurella bengalensis is one of the dominant uh, species or genus in the area. It's a strong color with the sunscreen property. And next in the central areas is also mixed deciduous forest with the small piece of the lichens on bark. Most of these belong to the Graphidaceae group, which is uh, one of uh, another dominant in, uh, in this forest. And southern part of Thailand is a long seashore and some island along the seashore. This you can find some uh, <clears throat> Group of lichen, uh, like the Calopraca group, and also some uh, others, like from uh, the Graphidaceae group. So there are many groups of uh, lichens in in the tropics, which uh, we can learn or study. Back to my work, uh, we start. Uh, research at the Khao Yai National Park, which is not far from Bangkok. It's about two hour drive. And the park has a various type of the forest, like the tropical rainforest, lower mountain forest, dry deep telocarp forest, and the secondary forest, and dry evergreen forest. So this is uh, many types of the lichens that we can learn from there. For the common lichen at the Khao Yai National Park, some belong to uh, Graphidaceae, which uh, look like the lip, like the, on the bark of the tree there. And some like the uh, belong to the family uh, family uh, TPC. Uh, the black one is a uh, Tipitilium tropicum. Uh, orange one is a uh, Laurella bengalensis, and the uh, yellow one is a uh, Tipitilium illutilia. This is a common species in the dry tropical forest. But there are also another uh, type of the lichens in the national park, like the lichens belong to the Telotemasi, like this one, and uh, the Folios one, like the, this belong to the Pamiria C. But now, uh, study for the lichens in the national park are more dangerous because of the animal, as you seen from from uh, from this uh, picture. There are some uh, wild animals like the elephant. So when you go to collect now, you need uh, like the ranger or the national park staff to look after you. This is because. Uh, there are more cars passing the national park, and now uh, animals are familiar to the uh, people who uh, drive past the area. So when you go to collect, you have to be uh, careful. From the fieldwork uh, in Thailand, now we can 
uh, conclude that we have uh, about uh, 1,300 uh, species from Thailand from the checklist, uh, checklist about five years ago. That's uh, from the field work. This is uh, compared to uh, other, uh, other countries uh, around the world. But working with the lichens is not only in the field, but also with the fungal partner. What we know from the fungal partner, when we uh, study uh, biodiversity of lichens in Thailand, some people are interested about the fungal partner. Uh, and from the text, like the uh, lichen symbiosis by the Ahmad Jan, they mentioned the lichen forming fungi, or in the past, they call as a microbion as a common features when grow on the nutrient agar. So this is mean not too difficult to grow, but they grow very slowly and form the compact and evaluate, evaluated colonies. So what it looks like is difficult to know from the literature at that time. And they cannot uh, organize uh, natural talus like the, uh, it's only uh, the mycelium in the in the culture. So this is a uh, difficult. And also in the lichen talus is a uh, mix with the other fungus. So when you isolate, you have to make sure that you get the right one, the lichen forming fungi, not the saprophyte or uh, other type of uh, fungus that uh, associate in the in the talus. And because of the matter fungus that's uh, growing in the lichen talus, they are mostly uh, fast growing, which uh, difficult for us if it's uh, contaminated to the culture. So this is uh, that we learn from, from the text at the first step. And for the tropical uh, lichen forming fungi, it's a few study. Amma in about 1960, he, he isolated the fungal and alcohol partner. This is uh, the first uh, uh, literature that uh, he can confirm that uh, these two partners can be separated. And the work from uh, Matty in about 1980s, he studied some uh, chemistry from the lichens uh, in genus uh, TPTSC and also with the, the chemistry from the fungal that uh, culture in the petri dish. Peter Crittenden, uh, he also isolated the lichen forming fungi, but most of the work is uh, temperate lichens. And Professor Yamamoto from Akita, he also studied for the culture of the lichen forming fungi in in the laboratory. So the tropical lichen is not well studied at that time. I had a chance to uh, join the BMS. Uh, centenary uh, meeting in Sheffield. And this time I have a chance to uh, discuss and uh, learn more about the uh, lichens with the uh, expertise, uh, especially uh, from Professor David Hawksworth. This is uh, at his house in uh, uh, London. That he have uh, some uh, advice for uh, my work. And also this with uh, Pat Woosley in uh, Liverpool for the Tropical My Mycology meeting. So the technique that uh, I isolate the, the 
Lichen forming fungi is from the ASCO spore. Firstly, uh, I follow the protocol by uh, Peter Crittenden. Uh, I visit him at the Nottingham and he confirmed that my culture is uh, the microbion or lichen forming fungi. So from the ASCO spore, we start with the Lichen from the family Cypriaceae. This is a lichen thalas. So we got the spores like this. And we can see the spore germination. So we can confirm that it's a real uh, lichen forming fungi. This also the spore from uh, family Cypriaceae. From and this from uh, Gavidasi. If you see this picture, uh, the lichen thalas look uh, not different from the thalas and also from the spore. But from the molecular work, we found that uh, they are different. So, Tipitidium uh, elutilia and Tipitidium subutilia and tipitium plantastomum is uh, separate by the molecular work. Because we cannot use uh, only a morphology morphological character. <clears throat> this three species is uh, very similar for the thalas and also the spore size. So the molecular work uh, combined with the chemical profile, these uh, three species are distinct. And uh, Tripidium pantastomum and Subilutilia were reported as a new record for Thailand. And also for the genus Astrogillium, five new species can be uh, uh, <laughs> report as a new species for Thailand by the molecular work uh, by the ITS, uh, LSU, SSU, and RPB1. And one new record also from uh, this work. For the uh, Tripitilium, uh, it's the first record report of this genus in Thailand. And we can use uh, mitochondria SSU and LSU to uh, character the ASCO spore. It's, it's not limited by the transfer receptate. For culturing, it's not only for, uh, for the taxonomy. We uh, did some for the some uh, culture that we can grow in the liquid culture. But we use the sponge for support, but this is uh, easy to grow, but it's not uh, well produced, uh, the metabolite. So the metabolite, uh, we back to the solid culture. And we found that it's a good uh, for for culture in the solid, and we have uh, some chemistry test for this. Also, with the uh, lichen in the family Atruniaceae, we found uh, a new species with the. Uh, new compound from culture. And confirm with the uh, chemis uh, chemistry uh, technique, the TLC, HPLC, and NMR, we got the new, new compound with the
วิเจอร์ไบโอเอสเซ่ for antimicrobial antioxidant and some enzyme inhibitor and also at the research unit we have a activity <coughs> we collect about the eighty thousand specimens and with the training for the student and for the colleague from another university in uh, country and also in the Southeast Asia. We have uh, 20,000 foreign uh, specimen donated by Professor Randell from UCLA. This is uh, the, the place that he collects around the world. And about new 100 new species that uh, the team published from the Thailand for the new new species in a tropical area. And also we organized some uh, workshop, uh, one with the uh, USM in Malaysia and also the workshop in the uh, university. This also the uh, other activity for the air pollution work and for the microclimate and for the lichen dye. Thank you, uh, BMS, for uh, let me join and for University Ramgam Hang and. Uh, the funding from RPSG and RCT Thailand and also the Film Museum Chicago and colleagues from research unit and my student. I end up with the, this uh, picture. It's uh, Lynn Body visit my lab uh, about 10 years ago. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Ek. It was a bit of a shock seeing me um, appear on the screen at the end there. <laughs> our, our fourth speaker this morning is Bernice Bankol um, from Benin. And um, Bernice uh, is a plant pathology researcher, and uh, she did her undergraduate and master's degree actually in um, Benin, but then went to uh, the University of KwaZulu-Natal in um, South Africa, um, and she carried on working there. Uh, as a postdoc fellow before returning to Benin. Now, um, Bernice has been having, I, I, we're very grateful for her making it here today uh, because she's had quite difficulties getting in because of the rains and, and then because of um, the links, et cetera, um, with Zoom. And uh, so we have a slightly different setup now for Bernice, which I, I'm sure will will work fine and we'll work through. And that is, um, that Sally in the BMS office is going to to work Bernice's slides and, and then Bernice will talk to us over her phone. So hopefully all will be well, but we're very grateful for all of the efforts in, that, that Bernice and indeed all of you have put in um, to making this symposium a success. So let me pass over to you, Bernice, now um, and fingers crossed that all goes well. Uh, good morning, everyone. I good don't morning. know if you... Okay. We can hear you. Yes, that's wonderful. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thanks for having me this morning. Um, and sorry for all the troubles. I was trying my best to, to be online and to just give a small talk about fungi diversity in Benin. And like you said, I'm a plant pathologist. I really doesn't work uh, in fungi as a mycologist. I work on fungi as a pathologist and doing a lot of biological control on fungi. But I have a lot of great uh, interest on everything related to fungi. So uh, during some of my trip in Benin and between researcher friends, I discovered that there were very few uh, research 
uh, with regard to mycology and there are even very little mycologists in my country. So this talk to this morning is more about uh, um, shout out and let people know that uh, Benin also has some diversity and people should start uh, giving interest and maybe build a research group around the topics related to fungi in Benin. So I can say that uh, fungi are diverse organisms with over 144 uh, known species and each type has unique characteristics and plays important ecological roles. And diverse fungi are found in various habitats in Republic of Benin, and they play they play some important roles such as nutrients cycling, medicine, and food production. They maintain the ecosystem health. And they are also source of bioactive component with medicinal properties. They also involve decomposition organic matters and improve soil fertility. In West Africa countries, non-fungal diversity represent 11.4% of the expected diversity in particular for the Benin Republic, such known diversity is less than 2%. In fact, the Benin country is in West Africa and possess a rich and diverse natural environment that remain largely unexplored, unexplored in terms of fungal diversity and importance. Next slide, please. Okay, I was saying like in Republic of Benin, we have 100 species of fungi and the most common fungi are mushroom, yeast and mold. And they play a vital role in soil fertility, soil health, plant disease control, plant growth and food production. However, scientific information about the fungi diversity, the distribution and importance are indispensable for conservation and sustainable management. But currently there are very, there are very big gap in terms of knowledge and information related to those important key points I just uh, highlighted earlier. Can I have the third slide? So from this from these uh, slides, you can see from West Africa. These slides presented some accumulation of information related to the country where there were data based from the number of fungal species and their riches in West Africa countries. And clearly you can see that there is a very rich in West Africa diversity in, in terms of fungi, but very little has been done. There are public publication, but there are very little background when it's coming to those fungi that those are important in our culture and in our uh, household needs because they're becoming useful for many households in terms of protein. Can I have the fourth slide? So recently there've been some study and some projects where they start digging on the diversity and the presence of fungi in our forestry and around so many uh, ecosystem in Benin. But basically they focus in the forestry uh, edible mushrooms. So in this slice, you see on the right side or left side, I don't know how I can say it, if it's left or right side, some researchers are collecting some of those edible 
um, uh, mushroom and they base them, they store them in a mycological lab, which is in the north part of Benin, for some people to get involved on some research that are important in terms of the importance and the diversity on fungi in my in my country. Can I go to the last slides, please? So I I said that in currently in Benin in Benin diet there is a new development of interest on uh, on fungi and people becoming interest on knowing what are the diversity in terms of the the edible uh, mushroom so it's becoming a source of food and protein for some household and it's used basically also in medicine there are some start startup with some young uh, researcher involved in a lot of research now in fungi and it also provides income in terms of agriculture, forestry, and trade. Can I go to the last slide? So we, we for the Benin Republic, fungi diversity, there, there is in existence of unbalance and decrease in fungal diversity because also we have lack of mycologies and very few advanced conservation methods. And the effective preservation methods such as drying, freezing, and cryopreservation can are uh, some of those methods that can prevent fungal species loss in Benin. And those techniques has to be implemented if we have some mycologists and some research that are direct to the diversity of the fungi we have in the country. So today I just want to raise and I, I just want to raise the fact that there is a huge need to protect the fungal diversity in my country by developing some research that are focusing on the importance of those fungal species we have across the forest in the country. Thank you for listening to me. It wasn't a research work. It was just meant to, to talk about what is happening in terms of mycology and to invite people to give some interest on that field and build a research team if people are interested on in knowing what is going, in, going on on our ecosystem related to fungal diversity. So thank you. Thank you very much, Bernice. It's very good to, to hear what is going on in, in Benin. That's the, the first talk we've had today um, from Africa. We've moved across um, from Australasia and um, Asia across to Africa now. Um, and we all appreciate that we're all at different stages in our development of understanding and knowledge about fungi in different countries around the world. And of course, that's one of the reasons why um, we're trying to have this World Fungus Day so that we can share knowledge and understanding and hope uh, to get more activity going in places where it's only just beginning. So that was very useful for us very, uh, and very interesting. Uh, thank you very much.